Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of the community's favorite songs from 2022, looking at a group, a person named Hatchy. I'm not sure if this is an artist or a band yet. Uh, the track is called Giving the World Away. Let's dive into this and see what they're bringing to the table today. Okay. Really interesting pairing the synth with the uh, acoustic guitar. Tambourine off on the side. So many layers of production is really nice, clean, but ethereal. Yeah, really nice way to build up the energy out of that low point. I'm loving the way that the vocals are displayed right here. Very cool effect. Yeah, very cool way of building off of this bass and piano. That snare sound is so crisp. A variation on this pre-chorus. We've got this piano thing over on the right. Oh, it's actually the piano part from the chorus. So that's neat. And so that was their that was their in for the chorus rather than using the build up. Clever. Tons of reverb, but there is a bass giving us momentum under this. So this is a combination between the uh, 
the verse and the chorus. There's layers from each of them coming together to build this bridge. Outro. Okay. Is this a new trend? I'm pretty sure uh, we did a track. It was like a pop track a couple weeks ago that did the same exact thing. Was it the Let's Eat Grandma one? Le Levitation? I don't think that's the name of the song because that's <laughs> let's do a Lipa's track. Levitating. Maybe uh, it's similar titles. I don't know. Um... But it was verse, chorus, verse, chorus. I'm expecting a bridge, but instead I get an outro. And this is... Done in the span of a rather lengthy track for pop. For a long time, pop was fixated with the sub three minute song. This was four and three quarters. So close to five minutes long. And yet we didn't even have a third repetition of a chorus. It's interesting. Structure aside, what is going on here? And this is going to take a bit of time to dissect before we get into what I think they're doing. This song is ridiculously layered. And I'm not going to pick apart every single layer because one, I probably missed some, and two, we'd be here for an hour. <laughs> And while I, I have given some shorter tracks, some very lengthy videos, I don't think this is going to be one of those. I don't think every single layer is worth picking apart, but there's some really neat things going on here with layering and reuse and recontextualization of layers. So the song starts out and we have a piano idea on our right and it repeats three times so it gives us four four plays of this concept and on the final one on our left side we get sorry on our right side we get hit with well this is my right that would be right for you guys <laughs> what looks like right anyways um we get hit with this acoustic guitar synth layering which sounds really cool you get that buzziness that digital element from the uh, synth with this very bright, plucky, earthy sounds. Very acoustic from the acoustic. Yeah, it's acoustic guitar. Of course, it's acoustic. But um, And it kind of mixes the, the real and the digital there in a way that I, I really enjoy. Not every single digital and acoustic instrument sounds great together. But this, I don't, I mean, there's going to be production, of course, not just in how they create the synth sound, but also how they produce the acoustic guitar, whether it is a sample or a recorded line, there's still going to be production put on it. And the producer did a fantastic job bringing these two elements together. It sounds like a yin and yang kind of thing. Anyways, it's just, it's great, and it's put on top of this piano idea every four bars. And it's just, it's an interesting way to bring us into the track. It builds a lot of energy. It has this, uh, it gives us our four-bar phrase. And then the song starts proper. We get the vocals in. We get more synth lines. We get the bass. We get the drums. And everything has reverb except for these two first elements well the piano um yeah our left piano does have reverb but not like everything else that comes in it has just enough to give it that extra pop 
but not enough to to like drown everything out like everything else comes in and it becomes very dreamlike to me very ethereal and there's so much reverb on everything else um and it crafts a very specific atmosphere is this dream pop i think so <laughs> i'm barely getting a grasp on the metal genres and we explore those often I'm still real rough on my pop genres. Um, but it is. It's, it's very dreamlike. It has that, that waviness all throughout. And it's because every single instrument is dripping with this, this reverb. Um, and this section, I don't think there's anything here that really stands out yet. At least not by itself in a vacuum. It's all about dropping our our beat so we have the alternating bass on one and three and snare on two and four uh, we have our melody come in on the vocals and we have the atmosphere that's crafted which we'll hear throughout everything what's interesting is how this stuff gets recontextualized later on in the track this is mostly setting up the I don't know what the what's the term I'm going for here. It's setting up the foundation so that when we do have these callbacks later, there's a big payoff. Now what was really cool was we went from this and we brought all the energy down. And we went into a pre-chorus that was a bit more muted. I think we had the bass here and one synth, maybe the piano. We got rid of a lot of the reverb. We just kind of took the energy down a lot. And then we had a vocal uh, idea that was ping-ponging back and forth and rising in volume, and it was building this energy. And then we had a snare, not like the snare we had earlier, uh, do a roll alongside this ping-ponging vocal to bring the intensity up to land in the chorus. It worked very well. Now we have to talk about the drums real quick before we get into what the chorus is doing. The snare in this section was more of a traditional snare, almost untouched by production. But the snare in our verse, and what we hear everywhere else in this track, is heavily produced. There are a lot of effects put on it. And what comes out of it is one of the sharpest, poppiest not like poppy music, but it, it pops. You can just hear the snare every time it comes through. But it's not done in like a drumline style or a rock or metal style where you get this really loud crack at the beginning of the attack and then it sort of just tapers off quickly. This... I don't even know how to... I, crisp is what I said earlier, but I'm not sure if that really gets... Mm, what I feel out of this across. Crisp can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. But it has this very bright sizzle to it. There's some there's a really great amount of compression put on it. And I think it favors the high end as far as the EQ goes. And it's very the low end tapers off really quickly. But the high end gets to exist for a little bit, almost like this little bubble. If that, I don't even know if that makes sense. It, it makes sense in my brain. Um, and it's just this, it's like a, 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 if the snare could be a teardrop. Does that make sense to anybody? Like when, when water or tears or whatever hits water and it kind of like dips down and the, the water splashes up around it. Like that's what the snare feels like to me. It's very bright and bouncy with this great energy on the attack. I don't, I hope that works. If not, go listen to it and just form your own description of it, I suppose. It is, it's just a magical snare sound. It doesn't sound anything like a real snare. It's very digital. But in its placement in what everything else is doing in this song and the overall texture of what the song is and the type of timbres that they're playing with, it is perfectly chosen i love this snare sound in this song so it was really neat 
when we had the snare roll in our pre-chorus, or yeah, pre-chorus that took us into the chorus, and it was more of a traditional drum kit snare. Um, definitely the right choice, but I'm not sure why. Maybe it was just because a lot of the elements that created that atmosphere were missing here as we kind of brought everything down. And so, like I mentioned, it works well in that context, but maybe it doesn't work well without it. Uh, so that was just really neat. We come into the chorus, though, and we have variations on everything we just heard. The bass is still present. In fact, the bass is more present than ever. It has a four bar riff where we have, well, a four bar phrase with one bar licks. Bars one, two, and three are all the same thing. It loops every bar. And then our fourth bar, we have a little stinger that uh, gives us a little bit of embellishment, changes the idea up a little bit, and, lets, and allows us to come back to the beginning of the phrase, sort of putting a punctuation, a period at the end of this this, our, uh, this four bar idea. The vocals have shifted uh, just a tad, not in timbre or delivery, but in melody. They have a repeated line now and repeated words on top of that. Um, the synth line has changed. Uh, the piano line has changed, but they're all pretty much doing the same roles, which is semi-important for what happens in our outro. But for the most part, it's it's the verse version two. <laughs> same roles, same ideas, same texture, same atmosphere, just different notes. We come back down to our second verse, and I don't think anything changed here. There might have been something uh, that I missed, but if I remember correctly, it was primarily the same as our first verse. Our pre-chorus, though, is different, and I thought this was really neat, because a lot of bands, when they have a pre-chorus, they either repeat it one-to-one, uh, -one, or what I hear a lot of times, especially in rock, um, well, especially mainstream music in general, not just rock, definitely radio rock, but pop uh, does this as well especially in the last decade, like I just mentioned, aiming for those sub three minute times, just completely ditch the pre-chorus on your second time through. You heard it once, you don't need to do it again. Your, ver your second verse can go directly into the chorus. Um, and here we do neither of those. We actually take the piano line from the chorus and overlay it here with the bass from the old pre-chorus, we ditch the back and forth vocal idea, uh, we ditch the, the snare roll, and we bring in a synth near the end of it to bring us into the chorus, which isn't so much as this rise into it, this escalation that we had like the first time, it's more of just like tossing the layers back on. We have half of the layers here, and when we get into the chorus, we just toss the other half in there. There isn't really a buildup into it, which was interesting, but it also makes it feel less like a distinct section and more like an addendum to the chorus. So the pre-chorus actually changes its role in the structure, or the first time it was designed to introduce it through uh, a drop and a rise to kind of create, uh, what do they call that? In, in electronic music. I don't know. Uh, when you escalate everything and it leads into like that big downbeat. I don't know. Uh, and here they didn't do that though. They, they introduced it through foreshadowing instead. So they actually utilize the pre-chorus in two different ways through two, two different techniques. Um, and two completely different approaches. While it's still very clearly in my ears is the pre-chorus, the bass uh, and the drums and the lack of uh, layers in general are identical between the two. It's just what they put above that changed. And it makes the song feel different in our second half. I'm curious if they changed the lyrics at all in the second chorus. Uh, I think that would be a neat little addition 
to showcase the like a change of perspective. We got to the chorus in a different manner, so you know our perspective lyrically here is going to be different as well. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lean too heavy into that, but it would be really neat if that's what they did. After this chorus, we go into what I thought was the bridge, but was actually the outro, which was half of the layers from the verse and half of the layers from the chorus. And this is the payoff I'm talking about where we get this new unique element or new unique section without actually writing any new elements from what I could tell. Everything I, I was like, oh, this came from that. This came from that. This was also from the verse. I know this synth was from the chorus. I don't think anything new was written for it, but it feels like a new section while also feeling very similar to everything that came before. It feels cohesive. And that's because, as I alluded to earlier, see, I foreshadowed in my analysis, just like they foreshadowed in their music. Everything sort of sounds the same here. The atmosphere doesn't change. The roles don't change. I won't even say the pitch really changes in too many of these instruments. Uh, you know, if the synthesizer in the verse is between like B and G or whatever, you know, those five or six notes there, um, then that's the same range they'll have in the chorus as well. And what it means is that uh, we craft sections that are, for the most part, interchangeable in any of their sections. It almost becomes modular where you could swap the bass lines from one to the other, or the synth, or you know half of the instruments, and what you'll end up with is something that's going to require very little, if no tweaking, to still sound good. You might have, there might be a couple of choice areas where, you know, the synth line from one and the bass line for the other has some clashing notes on, you know, bar eight of it, right in the middle. And you're like, oh, okay, well, you go change one note and now you're done. You have a brand new section that you really didn't put a lot of work um, into, but you still crafted it. And this is what I talk about all the time, working smarter, not harder. Um, not only that, but it looks cooler. Someone breaks it down and now they can say you have foreshadowing and, and recontextualization in your music. And all you did was copy paste something. So yeah, I mean, there's lots of brilliant ways to reuse stuff you've already written. Um, and for all I know, they might have done that a lot in here. You know, there's other ways to uh, recontextualize music that I'm not going to pick up on a first time, such as inversion, where you take... Uh, a line you've written and you flip it upside down. So anything that was on the bottom open space of the staff is now going to be on the top open space of the staff. Uh, so in treble, it would go from an F to a high E. And you can also do reverse, where you take the idea and you reverse it. You play the last note first, um, sticking with the same movement and the same rhythm. You know, if you have a, a quarter note into a eighth note into a quarter note, or into a whole note, you would flip it. Now it's a whole into an eighth into a quarter. Um, you actually don't have to change anything, and most audio workstations have this stuff built right into it to invert or reverse or do an inversion of the reverse. Um, and so you can create lots of really cool things with that. Um, and those are things I'm probably not going to pick up on a first time listen. But it's still ways to create new music out of something you've already written. So, yeah, always work smarter, not harder. You get really cool stuff like this. Um, and I end up really enjoying the outro because it does feel like a new section, but it feels cohesive. I think my only problem with it is that it doesn't end well. It feels, again, like a continuation of what we're doing, not a wrapping up of what we had done. And so it really caught me off guard when the song was over. I think that's my only critique of this is that the outro doesn't feel like an ending. Um, and so the song does feel cut short. All right, I'm going to hit some lyrics here and uh, then we'll wrap this up. So this is interesting. Um, it seems very straightforward in our verse chorus. Both of the verses are talking about uh, a U presumably somebody other than our narrator, who had a positive outlook on life, 
and one day it was dashed to the ground and the their motivations that they had in life to create positivity were replaced with motivations of negativity possibly to uh you know break something or or to uh, i don't know they see some sort of injustice they want to fix and now they're taking it upon themselves not to look at the positive in life but the negative um the chorus says stop giving the world away stop giving the only heart you've got so uh it's almost like saying don't give in to these destructive tendencies some battles are worth fighting and others aren't is kind of the thing i'm getting here One line that I really like, it's actually a several lines, says, uh, if you could take a break to recalibrate, you'd see beyond the sky. I only want your world to keep you awake. Don't lose your chance to fly. Don't let this tie you down, right? And of course, keeping with the, the theme there of seeing beyond the sky and choosing to fly, seeing that you can go beyond what you can already see flying past where you thought your limits were i love that whole idea right there but then the bridge and the outro paint a different picture it says in the end you'll go away for your cause and i wait dissipate with the days and it almost sounds like no matter what there's no convincing this other person that they need to stop their crusade and focus on more positive outlets for their motivations and creativity. And regardless, our narrator is going to wait for them to come back. The outro repeats, what if what drew us to one another triggers our demise? So what if the elements that we really liked about each other is actually going to be what tears us apart? We're so maybe it's opposites attract and they're just too far opposite to work well together in their relationship, whether that's familiar or, you know, whatever. It really feels like the song is going in a feel good i'll help you you know i'll help remind you of the good stuff in life and the ending doesn't go that way no matter what our narrator can't get through to this person and they're going down a path that's going to lead to the end of this relationship and it's just such a modern take on this I feel like a lot of a lot of songs that went in this angle in uh when I was growing up, so not nineties, I don't really remember much of that. So two thousands, maybe even the early twenty tens were very positive, right? Maybe the bridge got a little darker, but we always ended up back at the chorus, which like here is a very positive idea. Stop giving the world away. You know, it's it's the thesis statement of the song. Uh, you know, start, you know, healing yourself. But here we don't get a chance to come back to that. We skip straight to the ending, which is kind of bleak. And that's such a modern take on this idea is to look at more than the negative reality of how things actually will probably go. Not everything gets solved by the end of an episode and a catchy chorus doesn't always bring people back to rational thinking. wild not quite as dark as everything else we've listened to this week but i mean not a not a great not a great story either lyrically at least musically it was a jam you know i'm starting to really dig that hazy dreamlike atmosphere it's got to have a specific hook to it i think just going Going ham in that direction leads you into stuff like shoegaze, and that 
hasn't clicked with me historically. But here, where it's still kind of, it's dipping its toe into that, uh, that type of production and sound while still having a huge foot on the land. <laughs> this metaphor is getting real weird. Their other foot is still very firmly set down in the realm of melodies and hooks and, and beats and stuff like that. Um, elements that I traditionally like in music. I can really get into the atmosphere that shoegaze and uh, genres like it like to dig into without being thrust into just that sound. There's still elements here that I can hold on to. All right. Those wrap up my thoughts on Hatchie's Giving the World Away. I want to check this out real quick, though. So there's a vocalist, a backing vocalist, and a programmer. Bass, drums, guitar, keyboard. So this is a band. Very cool. Oh, yeah, they're listed as Pop, Shoegaze, and Dream Pop. Nailed it. Get better at this. <laughs> Anyways, those are my thoughts on Hatchie's Giving the World Away. This is where y'all come in. Let me know what you thought of this track, if you enjoyed it or not, anything that stood out to you, anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on. Put those ideas down in the comments. Above that, there's a description box, and there you can find a link for Linktree. Clicking on it takes you to this menu, which has links for everything related to the channel. You can find my music. You can find uh, a link to the Discord community. You can find ways to support the channel and so much more. There's a ton of stuff in there. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. We have a special selection uh, as well coming out today. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC, as usual. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.